The XXXY system is not the only mechanism of sex determination. In fact, there are actually several other systems that we know about um, that produce uh, dimorphic, sexually dimorphic individuals. Um, so in humans and many other mammals, we have XX uh, making females and XY producing males. And the presence of that Y chromosome is really what's important for um, giving the individual their male characteristics. There are a couple of other systems we're going to talk about uh, today. We've also got the XYXO system, the ZZZW system, and then um, a couple of systems where there are no sex chromosomes as we would normally think of them. So Drosophila is a good example of the XYXO uh, situation, and there are many other invertebrates. Um, particularly uh, several types of insects that follow the same sort of pattern. So in Drosophila, sex is determined by the number of X chromosomes, and the Y chromosome really plays no specific role in sex determination. In fact, it's actually the ratio of Xs to the number of autosomes within the organism that determines whether or not the individual is female. So in many cases, there's not even a Y chromosome, and any situation with an X chromosome produces a female. So really any number of X chromosomes is going to produce a female. So we have a couple examples up here on top of this system. With our Drosophila, we have uh, males as XY or XO individuals. Um, now again, this uh, producing a male requires um, the uh, essentially a lack of an X chromosome because females are produced by situations where we have two X chromosomes. So um, it is very similar to the situation that we find in humans, um, except that that Y chromosome is not necessarily required for um, producing the male sex. Um, in other insects, there's no Y chromosome at all, and it is simply the presence of two X chromosomes that produces a female and no, or I'm sorry, only one X chromosome that produces a male. So don't get too bogged down on um, how these are working because they are um, just slightly, excuse me, <clears throat> just slightly different situations than ours. Um, the thing to keep track of here is um, the example organism and uh, what's actually happening. So in this case, these invertebrates are lacking an X chromosome, and that is what is producing males instead of females. So we also have the ZWZZ sex determination system, and this happens in a lot of birds and many reptiles and then a few other invertebrates. So this, the ZWZZ system is going to be most similar to the XXXY system that we see in humans where there are two different sex chromosomes, one that is quite a bit larger than the other. Um, the difference here is that in birds, males are the homogametic sex. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, the males are going to be the ZZ situation and females are going to be the heterogametic sex with the ZW situation. Now this system has different evolutionary origins than um, the one, than the XXXY system. Um, so it's not, uh, it's not an analogous system. And in fact, the um, W chromosome here is actually the sex determining chromosome. So in females, it is the presence of the W, not the presence of the Z, um, that is going to make them female. Just like the Y chromosome though, that W chromosome has far less genes on it. Um, but um, as of now, they're not really sure if the um, uh, W chromosome is um, required for producing uh, females or if it is the lack of the ZZ. Um, but it is a very similar system to the XXXY system that we see in humans. Uh, there are also situations where there are no sex chromosomes. So no sex determining chromosomes. Um, and uh, there's a couple different ways that this comes about. In this situation, these sword tail fish 
Uh, there are no sex chromosomes at all. Instead, there are essentially alleles that determine sex and they behave like autosomal alleles in people. So in these fish, uh, females are the homozygous individuals for the allele and males are heterozygous. So uh, pretty straightforward, really. These are just found on, uh, their, on autosomes. They don't have their own separate chromosome. Um, so um, the inheritance tends to resemble an autosomal situation. Um, but the males are still, uh, in a sense, the, the heterogametic sex, the ones with uh, two different alleles. So honeybees have an interesting uh, sex chromosome situation. Um, in honeybees, males are actually haploid. Excuse me. So these individuals um, only have half their number of chromosomes. So they come from an unfertilized egg from the queen female. So uh, no sperm fertilize this egg and in this situation we get haploid male bees. So we have the picture here on the left hand side we have diploid female bee. She undergoes meiosis. Remember that meiosis reduces the number of chromosomes from diploid to haploid and when there's no fertilization in this situation those eggs grow into haploid male bees. However, uh, females come from a fertilized egg. So females are diploid and they're basically produced in the same sort of situ the same mechanism that females are in the X, 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 Y system. So female bee undergoes meiosis, or I'm sorry, her, her uh, gametes undergo meiosis to produce eggs that are either uh, A or B in this situation. Um, that's just to sort of help us keep track of what's going on here. Um, and then there, that egg is fertilized by a sperm from a haploid bee. Remember all of these individuals, all of these gametes are haploid. And so when fertilization occurs, re, we uh, return to this diploid situation. So females are the diploid individuals here. So uh, basically, you have a female queen who um, produces males without fertilization and female queens, I'm sorry, <clears throat> produces females um, through uh, normal sexual mating. Uh, lastly, we have something called environmental sex determination. Uh, so many species, um, these tend to be reptiles more often than um, other types, um, some birds even. Um, but many species use uh, environmental signals um, to determine sex. So this really could be a lot of different things. It could be um, pH, it could be crowding. It tends to be most frequently temperature though. So if the eggs are laid and incubated at a specific temperature, they're going to produce a specific ratio of um, individuals. So as I said, uh, most, uh, or sorry, a, a lot of reptiles, all crocodiles, most turtles, some lizards, um, produce their uh, sex ratios in this way. So we have an example here um, on this chart. So uh, if we look at these uh, turtle, or sorry, let's see, let's start on the left. Actually not sure what this organism is here. I think that it is a snapping turtle. Um, I should double check that. Uh, but basically this graph is showing the percentage of males. So in cooler temperatures, we have mostly females here. As the temperature in which the eggs are incubated increases, we increase the number of males in the, the clutch. And then as the temperature continues to increase, we decrease number of males and most of our uh, group of eggs are going to develop into females again. So here we get males at intermediate temperatures and females at either of the extremes. This turtle in the middle 
we have a um, high number of males during the cool temperature. And as the temperature drops off, we get more and more females from this clutch. Uh, crocodiles, so all crocodiles, crocodilians, I'm sorry, um, all crocodilians are going to uh, reproduce this way. So uh, we have a, a, when the temperatures are cooler, we get uh, essentially all females until we hit about between 31, 32 degrees. And then the number of or percentage of males in the clutch is going to increase rather quickly and then sort of drop off again and we get uh, more females in the, in the nest. So sea turtles, an example of how this might work. If the female sea turtle lays her eggs higher on the beach, they're going to experience warmer temperatures because they're going to have less water washing over them. The sunshine's going to warm them up a bit. And so they're going to have primarily females in their eggs. Down lower on the beach, though, that egg, I'm sorry, that nest is going to be cooled by the water um, whenever the tide comes in. And so that nest is going to contain uh, more males because the beach, the, there's going to be less sunlight warming that due to the presence of the water. So the general trend is that eggs at low temperature tend to develop as males, while females at higher temperature, I'm sorry, while eggs at higher temperatures develop as females. So this is just a quick summary. I'm not going to go through it, just a summary of the system, um, sort of help you keep track of uh, the different sex determination systems and what organisms go with it. You can find this on page 292. When we start looking at sex chromosomes and when we have situations where individuals of one sex have a different number of chromosomes than the other, we encounter a problem called dosage compensation. So basically, dosage compensation means that any of the homogametic sex individuals will express genes twice as much as, excuse me, as the heterogametics. So if you are an XX individual, in theory, well, in practice, you have twice the number of X-linked genes as an individual who is XY. And therefore, if you express all of those genes, a female is going to be expressing their genes at twice the level as a male because they can express the genes from each chromosome. So basically, you would get more gene expression of X chromosome genes in females than in males because there's no counterpart on that Y chromosome. So without a special mechanism to sort of regulate this double expression of the X genes, you would have individuals with, with an imbalance of gene expression. So this diagram here shows um, the X and X chromosome. So we would get um, copies of all of the genes expressed on one chromosome and on the other, but in the male, because we don't have homologs in that Y chromosome, we get different level of X-linked gene transcription. So only one gene from in that, end of, I'm sorry, one chromosome is being expressed. So just like there are different mechanisms of sex determination, there are different mechanisms to control dosage. Um, this is called dosage compensation. And there are basically three general mechanisms by which this can occur. Now, I find this diagram a little bit confusing. This is a big picture in your textbook. Um, but basically, it just goes through and shows what's going on. So in, an, in a Drosophila, if we have an XX individual, remember individuals with two Xs in Drosophila are female, they express their X chromosomes at normal levels. Um, in the males, where they only have one X chromosome, they actually sort of double the transcription rate of their genes on their X chromosome. So they compensate by expressing those X-linked genes more. 
Um, in C. elegans, chenorhabditis, that's our nematode, um, we get the backwards of that. So instead of overexpressing that single chromosome, they actually decrease expression by the presence of transcription factors on those X chromosomes. So the in uh, C. elegans, we have one X chromosome. Those genes are expressed normally. On the other X, in females, where we have two copies of the X chromosomes, they actually show decreased expression. So all of the genes are expressed just at lower levels. In mammals, um, in particular humans, we have something called X inactivation. So in females, one of their X chromosomes is inactivated. That means that only one X chromosome at any one time is being expressed, and therefore the levels of gene expression of the, those X-linked genes are the same in males and in females. So this X chromosome is, becomes super highly condensed into heterochromatin, um, and it's not transcribed. So right away, um, when a uh, cell is produced after the egg is fertilized and begins cell division, an X chromosome is inactivated in each of those cells. So um, just uh, by random chance, one of those X chromosomes is going to be uh, decreased and the, I'm sorry, reduced down to heterochromatin. It still remains there, but it is not expressed. And that condensation is maintained throughout the whole cell line that comes from that cell. So we've got this little image here. It's in your book if you want to see it a little bit bigger. Um, but you can see you have both chromosomes in this cell, both X chromosomes. Um, in each of these cells, that X chromosome is going to be condensed. And so down here in this third generation, we see the blue chromosomes condensed, then the red, then the blue, then the red. This is just by chance. That X chromosome remains inactivated all the way through mitosis. So in all of the cells that are produced from this blue condensed cell, uh, we're going to produce blue condensed cells. And this is present, you can see this if you look at an egg cell as a bar body. So this is a dark uh, stained spot in the nucleus where that chromosome becomes very highly condensed. So now the issue here is that you still only have one gene being expressed um, in the X chromosome situation. Now sometimes this leads to some cool phenotypes. Um, an example of this is calico cats. So all calico cats are actually female because um, they are showing a sort of a side effect of this X inactivation. So if we go back to one of the cells in early development, if this individual is heterozygous for the fur color allele, um, let's see what happens. So this B gene, big B gene, is going to produce the gray coat color. The lowercase b is going to produce the orange coat color. So in a normal heterozygous situation, individuals who are big B, little b are just going to be gray. But if the um, cell line inactivates the orange gene, all of those cells are going to become gray. If in another cell line, the orange, I'm sorry, the gray gene is inactivated, those, those cells are going to produce the orange coat color. So essentially we have silencing of one of those genes. And then because we only have one copy of that gene, we can only express sort of like how the X-linked genes happen in males. And so you end up with these beautiful patches of black and orange fur on these calico cats.